Over the years, global focus and discourse on slavery has concentrated on the transatlantic trade that featured American and European merchants. The British, Portuguese, Dutch, French, Spaniards, and Danes of Denmark were involved in the oceanic trade in African men, women, and children, which lasted from the mid-16th century until the 1860s. At this time, more than 15 million Africans were enslaved and transported to the Americas. Only 10 to 12 million would make it through the sea to face a life of harsh labor, discrimination, and abuse. While the transatlantic slave trade is well known, taught in school, another form of slavery that was just as devastating has been kept secret. This other trade remains largely ignored, and at times has even been treated as a taboo subject, despite being a key component of African history owing to the devastating impact it has had on the continent, its generations, and its people's way of life. In this video, we are going to talk about the Arab-Muslim slave trade. We will take a look at the Trans-Saharan slave trade in particular, where Arabs would raid, capture, and enslave even fellow Arabs and Muslims just because they had black skin. How Arabs justified these deeds using verses from their holy scripture and how the slave trade still exists today. Before we get right into the video, please smash the like button and subscribe to the channel to keep informed of our eye-opening black narrative. The Arab Muslim slave trade, also known as the Trans-Saharan trade or Eastern slave trade, is noted as the longest slave trade, having occurred for more than 1,300 years, while taking millions of Africans away from their continent to work in foreign lands in the most inhumane conditions. Scholars have christened it a veiled genocide attributing the tagline to the most humiliating and near-death experience slaves were subjected to, from capture in slave markets to labor fields abroad and the harrowing journey in between. While official figures on the exact number of slaves captured from Africa in the Trans-Sahara trade are contested, most scholars put the estimate at about 9 million. Records of slave trading and transportation in the Sahara date back as far as the 3rd millennium BC during the reign of the Egyptian king Sneferu who crossed the fourth cataract of the Nile into what is today modern Sudan to capture slaves and send them north. These raids for prisoners of war, who subsequently became slaves, were a regular occurrence in the ancient Nile Valley and Africa. During times of conquest and after winning battles, the ancient Nubians were taken as slaves by the ancient Egyptians. The Garamantes, an ancient civilization based primarily in the southern region of Libya, relied heavily on slave labor from sub-Saharan Africa. They used slaves in their own communities to construct and maintain underground irrigation systems known to Berbers as Fogara. Ancient Greek historian Herodotus recorded in the 5th century BC that the Garamantes enslaved cave-dwelling Ethiopians known as Troglodyte, chasing them with chariots. In the early Roman Empire, the city of Lepsis established a slave market to buy and sell slaves from the Bantu African interior. In the 5th century AD, Roman Carthage was trading in black slaves brought across the Sahara. The empire imposed customs tax on the trade of slaves. Black slaves seem to have been valued as household slaves for their exotic appearance. Some historians argue that the scale of slave trade in this period may have been higher than medieval times due to the high demand for slaves in the Roman Empire. However, the slave trade through the Sahara in antiquity may have been small and rare, as Saharan trade didn't reach large dimensions until the Arabs and Berbers introduced large numbers of camels into the desert. The Trans-Saharan slave trade, established in antiquity, continued during the Middle Ages. Following the early 8th century conquest of North Africa, Arabs, Berbers, and other ethnic groups ventured into sub-Saharan Africa first, along the Nile Valley towards Nubia, and also across the Sahara towards West Africa. They were interested in the trans-Saharan trade, especially in slaves, as there was a constant demand for slaves in the Eastern Arab nations and Constantinople. The Muslim slave traders distinguished themselves from the peoples on the other side of the Sahara, referring to these African populations as Zanj or Sudan, meaning black. Arabs would routinely acquire slaves through violent raiding, followed by capturing them and sending them on dangerous forced marches across the Sahara to slave markets where they would be treated as chattel, which is personal property that can be bought and sold. 
In North Africa, the main slave markets were in Morocco, Algiers, Tripoli, and Cairo. Sales were held in public places, such as souks. Aside from raiding, slaves could also be obtained by purchasing them from local black rulers. In addition, some would steal the children of the Zanj, luring them with dates and lead them from place to place, until they seize them, take them farther in the country, and transport them to their own countries. In 1353, the Berber explorer Ibn Battuta would record accompanying a trade caravan to Morocco, which carried 600 black female slaves who were to be used as domestic servants and concubines. When Battuta visited the ancient African kingdom of Mali, he recounted that the local inhabitants vied with each other in the number of slaves and servants they had, and was himself given a slave boy as a hospitality gift. The routes taken by slave caravans transporting slaves depended on their destination. Slaves headed to Egypt would be carried by boat down the Nile, and slaves headed to Arabia would be sent to ports on the Red Sea such as Swakin and Asab. Slaves headed to North Africa would have to take the Saharan trade routes, which had been in use since around 1000 BC. These include routes connecting modern-day Libya to Nigeria, the tripoli fezzanbornu route, connecting Libya to areas of what are today Chad, Niger, and Cameroon, and the east-west route connecting Egypt to Ghana, Mali, and Songhai. Kanembornu Zawila was another route to North Africa as the Kanembornu Empire in the eastern part of Niger was an active part of the trans-Saharan slave trade for centuries, and the trade formed the basis of the empire's prosperity. Passage through the Sahara required the expertise of ethnic groups whose lifestyles were uniquely adapted for survival in scorching, arid environments, namely the local Berber tribes and the foreign Bedouins from Arabia. For example, the Tuareg and others who are indigenous to Libya facilitated, taxed, and partly organized the trade from the south along the trans-Saharan trade routes. Various nomadic peoples played critical roles as guards, guides, and camel drivers. As a result, they were granted autonomy and treated as allies by governments of North Africa. Oases were vital way stations for caravans, and those such as Aujala, Gadamese, and Kufra in Libya allowed both north-south and east-west travel. Even with expert help, the passage could still prove deadly to merchants and slaves. Sometimes whole caravans of thousands of people could disappear without a trace. Between AD 650 and 1600, an average of 5,000 Africans were shipped out by the Arabs. This makes a rough total of 7.25 million. Then, between 1600 and 1800, another 1 1.4 million Africans were shipped out by the Arabs. The 19th century represented the highest point of the Arabian trade, where 12,000 Africans were shipped out every year. The total figure for the 19th century alone was 1.2 million slaves to Arabia. Thus, in terms of numbers, Arabia's 9.85 million is not far behind the conservative estimate of nearly 12 million African victims of the Atlantic slave trade. Some African historians, though, reject these figures on the grounds that they are too low. They suggest over 50 million Africans were shipped out during the Atlantic trade alone. According to some researchers, another 4.1 million Africans were shipped across the Red Sea to the Persian Gulf and India. This trade also, with the notable exception of some Portuguese involvement in the area of Mozambique and of 18th and 19th century French exports to islands under their control in the Indian Ocean, was largely conducted by Muslims. Throughout the 19th century, the Omani Arab rulers of Zanzibar shipped hundreds of thousands of African slaves to work on clove plantations on the island. It was this trade that gave Europe and America so much satisfaction after abolishing their own trade in African slaves, to highlight the wickedness of the Arab slavers who continued to enslave Africans well into the first decades of the 20th century. Even to this day, Arab slavers are still at work in Sudan and Mauritania, buying and selling black Africans. Like the Atlantic trade, the Arabian trade's Middle Passage was equally as horrible and terrifying. The Middle Passage describes the harrowing journey lasting several months from Africa's west coast to the Americas, during which millions of Africans, packed like sardines in the slave ships, died of thirst, hunger, rough seas, and sometimes from the sheer brutality inflicted by the European slavers.
In the Arabian trade, the trudge across the Sahara in leg and neck chains and necks in large forked sticks and hands tied with bark thongs was particularly harsh on the African slaves. The hardships of these long marches across the desert were considerable, and much later travelers reported that the routes were lined with the parched skeletons of those who succumbed to exhaustion and thirst along the way. The Arab slavers did not only march their African captives to Arabia, they also sometimes sold them to European slavers. Enterprising Arab merchants and middlemen would gather in Zanzibar for raw materials including cloves and ivory. They would then buy black slaves who they would use to carry the raw materials and also work in their plantations abroad. Slaves from as far as Sudan, Ethiopia and Somalia would be availed at the Zanzibar market and shipped through the Indian Ocean to the Persian Gulf or Arabic Peninsula where they worked in Oman, Iran, Saudi Arabia and Iraq. African Muslims were, however, never captured as slaves due to the Islamic legal views, but this changed very quickly. On the other hand, the Trans-Saharan caravan concentrated on the West African region, straddling the Niger Valley to the Gulf of Guinea, along the Trans-Saharan roads to slave markets in Maghreb and the Nile Basin. The voyage that could take up to three months involved inhumane conditions that saw slaves die along the way due to diseases, hunger, and thirst. An estimated 50% of all slaves in this trade would die in transit. Other 19th century European explorers recorded their perilous experiences traveling through the Saharan desert alongside slave caravans. The explorer Gustav Nachtigal reported finding numerous bones at desert springs that had run dry. Nachtigal estimated that for every one slave that successfully arrived at the market three or four had either died or escaped. Cold could also kill in the desert as the explorer. Heinrich Barth relayed a story that the Vasir of Bornu had lost 40 slaves in a single night in Libya. A British account described 100 skeletons. In modern times, the popular image of African slavery springs from the vision of a tormented male suffering under the lash of unceasing labor on some New World sugar plantation. Yet the real face of servitude finds its focus in the forced migration of millions of girls and young women across the Sahara and the Horn of Africa into the institutions of Islamic concubinage. While in the European New World, the measure of a man's stature was mapped out and calibrated on the physical dimensions of empire built upon the sinews of forced masculine labor in the Islamic Orient wealth, however, it was a reflection of prestige, young girls, the vessel of male hubris. Thus, women slaves in the Arab world were often turned into concubines living in harems and rarely as wives their children becoming free. A large number of male slaves and young boys were castrated and turned into eunuchs who kept watch over the harems. Castration was a particularly brutal operation with a survival rate of only 10%. These eunuchs, who were around seven times more expensive than non-castrated males, could also be used as administrators, tutor, secretaries, commercial agents, and even concubines. Due to strictures within Islamic law, slaves would not usually be castrated within Muslim territory and, therefore, would be castrated before being sent across the Sahara. Sometimes slaves were castrated after purchase in North African slave markets. While the Europeans paid a higher price for male slaves than females, the reverse was the case with the Arabs. Moreover, while the European slavers profited mainly from male labor, the Arabs saw profit in sexual satisfaction and reproductive potential. Slavery unquestionably checked population growth in Africa and consequentially placed tremendous pressure upon gender and marital relationships during the Arab slave. In this sense, the feminine-oriented Arab slave trade, though neither motivated nor executed with economic benefits as prime objective, caused far greater demographic damage and consequently greater economic decline with its excessive poaching of the reproductive potential of the harvested areas. The Arabs raided sub-Saharan Africa for 13 centuries without interruption. Most of the millions of men they deported disappeared as a result of inhumane treatment. This painful page in the history of black people has apparently not been completely turned. In the Muslim culture of the Middle Ages, blackness became increasingly identified with slavery. This was justified by appeals to a specific interpretation of the biblical story of Curse of Ham that posited Ham had been cursed by Noah in two ways. The first, 
the turning of his skin black, and the second, that his descendants would be doomed to slavery. Muslim slave traders would use this as a pretext to enslave blacks, including black Muslims. In the late 14th century, a black king of Bornu wrote a letter to the Sultan of Egypt complaining of the continual slave raids perpetrated by Arab tribesmen, which were devastating his lands and resulting in the mass enslavement of the black Muslim population of the region. In Al-Andalus, the area of medieval Iberia under Islamic control, black Muslims could be legally held as slaves. This all occurred despite the orthodox Muslim jurist position that no Muslim, regardless of race, could be enslaved. Even as late as the 19th century, many of the common people in Islamic society still believed that enslavement based on skin color rather than based on religion was approved by the religious laws of Islam. In Central Africa during the 16th and 17th centuries, slave traders continued to raid the region as part of the expansion of the Saharan and Nile River slave routes. Captives were enslaved and shipped to the Mediterranean coast, Europe, Arabia, the Western Hemisphere, or to the slave ports and factories along the West and North Africa coasts, or South, along the Ubangui and Congo rivers. Even though the slave trade was officially abolished in Tripoli in 1853, in practice, it continued until the 1890s. And even as Europe, one of the key players in the African slave trade, abolished the practice hundreds of years ago, and the United States officially ended it in 1865, Arab countries continued the trade, with majority ending it late in the 20th century. In Malawi, slavery was officially criminalized in 2007, with mentions of some Arab countries currently being involved, albeit clandestinely. By 1858, the British consul in Tripoli had recorded that more than 66% of the value shipped across the Sahara was made up by slaves. The British consul in Benghazi wrote in 1875, that the slave trade had reached an enormous scale and that the slaves who were sold in Alexandria and Constantinople had quadrupled in price. This trade, he wrote, was encouraged by the local government. By the mid-19th century, it's possible that nearly 10,000 slaves were being transported to North Africa yearly. After the establishment of the British and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society in 1839 to fight slave trading in the Mediterranean, Ahmad I Ibn Mustafa, Bey of Tunis, agreed to outlaw exporting, importing, and selling slaves in 1842, and he made slavery illegal in 1846. In 1848, France outlawed slavery in Algeria. Slavery was not abolished in Mauritania until 1981. Since the beginning of the Libyan Civil War of 2011, that saw the overthrow of Muammar Gaddafi's regime by NATO-backed anti-Gaddafi forces. Libya has been plagued by instability and migrants with little cash and no papers have become vulnerable. Libya is a major exit point for African migrants heading to Europe. The International Organization for Migration, or IOM, published a report in April 2017 showing that many of the migrants from West Africa heading to Europe are sold as slaves after being detained by people smugglers or militia groups. African countries south of Libya were targeted for slave trading and transferred to Libyan slave markets instead. According to the victims, the price is higher for migrants with skills like painting and tiling. Slaves are often ransomed to their families, and in the meantime, until the ransom is paid, they can be tortured, forced to work, sometimes to death and eventually executed or left to starve if they can't pay for too long. Women are often raped and used as sex slaves and sold to brothels and private Libyan clients. Many child migrants also suffer from abuse and child rape in Libya. After receiving unverified CNN video of a November 2017 slave auction in Libya, a human trafficker told Al Jazeera that hundreds of migrants are bought and sold across the country every week. There were other confirmed reports of slavery in Libya by Arabs in the 21st century. A Libyan group known as the Asma Boys have antagonized migrants from other parts of Africa from at least as early as 2000, destroying their property. Nigerian migrants in January 2018 gave accounts of abuses in detention centers, including being leased or sold as slaves. Videos of Sudanese migrants being burnt and whipped for ransom were released later on by their families on social media. In June 2018, 
the United Nations applied sanctions against four Libyans, including a Coast Guard commander and two Eritreans, for their criminal leadership of slave trade networks. Even as the rest of the world realized the harm slavery did to an entire continent and made a declaration to abolish it, the Arabs protested it, and it took a lot of international trade and revolt by the slaves for them to end it. Most of the African authors have not yet published a book on the Arab Muslim slave trade out of religious solidarity. There are 500 million Muslims in Africa, and it is better to blame the West than talk about the past crimes of Arab Muslims. Looking back at history, you can tell of the horrors of the Arab slave trade, the millions that died on the journey through the desert, and the torture that waited for them once they reached their destination. What's surprising is that not many people talk about this part of history. It's like a secret that's not shared. But we need to know about it because it still affects people today. Shockingly, the echoes of this cruel past continue to reverberate in modern times. In some Arab countries in Africa, the legacy of slavery persists, with migrants looking for a better life being greeted with bondage and been shipped off to the highest bidder. We all need to work together to change this. We should learn about this hidden past and talk openly about it. By doing that, we can start to make things better. We have to teach others, be aware, and speak up so that no one is treated like a slave anymore. We must remember the people who suffered because of the Arab Muslim slave trade. They were strong and didn't give up, even in tough times. By understanding this history and promising to end slavery everywhere, we show that we care about fairness, equality, and making the world a kinder place for everyone. As always, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos to let more people know the truth about blacks and to hear their own part of the narratives. Thanks for watching.